Hi and welcome back. In this video we're going to be looking at the first few letters of the Greek alphabet and these are letters that are familiar f to English speakers. Letter letters that look like English letters uh, from the Roman alphabet and letters that uh, make the same sorts of sounds. Now learning the Greek alphabet is one of these things that often uh, is just taken for granted in Greek courses. Uh, some Greek courses require that you learn the alphabet ahead of time on your own. Some courses expect you to just learn it uh, as homework uh, the first week. Um, but a lot of people find this intimidating. So we're going to take a few videos to slowly introduce you to uh, the Greek alphabet, starting with these first few fairly familiar letters. The alphabet that Greek uses is sort of a familiar cousin to our Latin alphabet that's used in English. Uh, there are a lot of familiar letters and the Greek alphabet was actually the source of our own which is why we have uh, those overlaps. The Greek alphabet was adapted by uh, Latin speakers to write the Latin language and then that Latin alphabet was in turn uh, adopted for Greek and other European languages. Here's a chart of the whole Greek alphabet, just for your reference. Uh, you don't have to learn all of these at once now, um, but that's also pre presented in alphabetical order for Greek, and uh, it'll be important for you to learn the order of the alphabet so that you can use dictionaries and reference works that are set up uh, in alphabetical order based on the Greek language. But let's start with the Greek letter alpha. The second letter of the Greek alphabet is the letter beta. And uh, the uppercase again looks exactly like our letter B. The lowercase uh, actually looks like our uppercase letter in a kind of rounded almost bubble letter form, but it's still recognizable as a B, isn't it? Uh, it just has a, a short tail that sticks down below the line. And so it almost looks like a silhouette of a bird uh, perched on a, a branch. There we can see a, a bird that looks a little bit like the outline of a letter beta. Uh, the sound is just like our B, as in bird. Uh, in later Greek, it came to be softened to more of a v sound, like v, and so in modern Greek, uh, beta is actually pronounced v, veta, but in uh, the pronunciation that we're learning, uh, we're going to treat it as a b sound. The letter delta in the uppercase is actually a triangle, but in the lowercase looks uh, kind of like our letter d, with the rounded bottom and the stem. Um, the only difference is that the stem has kind of a, a hook on it. Uh, the sound uh, is the same as our uh, letter D, a D sound as in dart or dipper. And uh, those are helpful words because the uppercase actually looks a bit like a dart or the head of a dart, right? It's a triangle that's a point. And the, the lower case with its hook looks a little bit like a, a dipper or a ladle, doesn't it? The letter epsilon uh, is the equivalent of our letter E. And you can see that the upper case looks, again, just like our capital E. And the lower case, um, like with the beta, the lower case looks like a curvy version of our uppercase E. The sound is always a short E as in edge, eh. It's never a long E as in mere, and it never says a like in uh, werewolf. It's also never silent. So even if you see an epsilon at the end of a word, uh, it always uh, has a sound to it. You always say the, the eh sound. The letter iota looks just like our letter I. And uh, again, the uppercase is exactly like our uppercase I, and the lowercase looks very close to our lowercase letter I, um, but doesn't have a dot above it. Uh, the sound is usually like our E 
sound, as in ski. Occasionally it can make a shorter uh, i, as in pin, uh, but if you always pronounce it as e, as in ski, uh, you'll be fine. Never does Yoda make an i sound like the i in mile. It's always the e sound. Kappa, again the uppercase looks just like our letter K, and the lowercase looks like a curvy, shrunken version of our capital K. The sound again is k, just like k as in kite. The letter mu, it's not usually pronounced mu, it's mu, uh, the sound that a cow makes. Uh, the shape in the uppercase is just like a, an English or Latin letter M, and in the lowercase, again, looks like a curvy M, uh, but like with the beta, we have that arm that reaches down below the line a little bit. Be careful not to confuse uh, the lowercase mu with our letter U. This isn't an U sound, this is an M mm sound. So you need to notice the, the arms reaching down uh, and remember that, that uh, this is an M. But the sound is just like our letter M as in mole. The letter Omicron is shaped to look just like our O, uh, both in the uppercase and in the lowercase. The sound is always a short O sound, as in ostrich. It's never a long O like in whole. Greek does have another letter for the long O sound, but we'll learn it later because it looks a little bit funny. Um, omicron, though, literally means little O. Uh, mikra uh, is an adjective meaning little, and O is at the beginning. So this is the O micron, the little O. The letter sigma uh, actually has two different shapes depending on where it appears in a word. When it comes at the end of a word, it looks very much like our letter S. Um, when it comes in the middle of a word, it's going to look different, and we'll see that uh, in another video. But uh, it, it's useful to ask why. Why does this letter have two different shapes? And the simple answer is that uh, the final sigma, or the, the shape of sigma at the end of a word, is a holdover from the practices of medieval scribes. They would often have short uh, forms or alternate forms for letters at the end of a word. And that has just continued over into modern Greek uh, printed letters. So the shape of the final sigma looks like our S, except that uh, it curves below the line. So the second curve that curves to the left at the bottom, that actually dips below the line. And the upper curve is bigger than the lower curve. But with those exceptions, you can see that it looks very much like our letter S. And the sound is always like our S as in snake, never like Z as in has. It's always the S sound. Tau uh, looks in the uppercase just like our letter T, and in the lo lowercase, again, looks like a slightly curvy version of our uppercase T. The sound is just like our T, as in table, T. It never gets uh, uh, softened like in shun, T-I-O-N. Uh, it always has the hard T sound. Upsilon uh, is uh, very much like our letter U in the lowercase. Uh, just watch the uppercase because it ends up looking like an uppercase Y. Uh, but it, the lowercase uh, is where it, it uh, overlaps with our English letters. Um, both uh, our letter U and our letter Y come from the Greek letter Upsilon, so this is why there's the overlap. The sound of Upsilon is somewhere between uh, our U and E sounds. It's a lot like the German letter U with an umlaut, two dots above it, and it makes an E sound. A bit like the explanation ew. Uh, many just pronounce uh, it like ooh as in rude. Uh, so you can decide uh, depending on uh, uh, how much you like imitating other pronunciations whether to pronounce it just as ooh 
or try and produce that E sound, E. Now there are a couple of marks that aren't actually letters, but they're important to, to learn right at the beginning. Uh, the first is called the rough breathing mark. Uh, the Greek language has no letter H, um, and actually the letters that look like H uh, make a very different sound. But the sound H, the H sound, at the beginning of a, a word is made by this mark above the letter. It's almost always at the beginning of a word. Uh, if it's not at, on the very first letter, it'll be on the second letter. And it's only ever over a vowel or the letter rho, which is an R sound, although it looks like a letter P. Uh, so if the letter alpha, uh, like in this image here, uh, has this uh, sort of um, uh, curly mark over it, uh, we pronounce the alpha as if there was an H in front of it. Instead of just ah, uh, it's ha. And it makes the H sound like in heart. Uh, and I, I think that's a good connection because you can see that the curve looks like one half of a heart a little bit. Now the important thing is to remember that the rough breathing mark has the, the uh, curve pointing to the left because if you turn that rough breathing mark around, you have the smooth breathing mark. Uh, again, uh, this mark uh, isn't really a letter, but what it shows us is that there isn't an H sound at the beginning of the word. Now, that may seem a little bit odd to us, um, and really the smooth breathing mark isn't pronounced. Uh, it just indicates that there's an or ordinary vowel sound at the beginning of the word. Uh, so you can think of, of uh, the smooth breather uh, as having the same sort of uh, uh, significance that, that uh, the vowel O takes on when we pronounce the word open. You see, there's a tiny little uh, burst of breath when we start the O sound, open. And uh, it's good to remember the connection between the smooth breathing mark and open because when the, the curve is open to the beginning of the word, open to the left, uh, then it's a smooth breathing mark. If the curve is closed to the left, closed to the beginning of the word, then it's the rough breathing mark that we saw before. So keep those two breathing marks straight. It's really important to get those uh, clear right at the beginning. Greek does also have four accent marks. Uh, just like in French or Spanish, we have an acute accent, a grave accent, a circumflex accent, and an umlaut, which is also in Greek called a diaresis, two dots above the letter. Uh, notice that the circumflex accent has two shapes depending on the Greek font, uh, the particular style of the Greek letters uh, that a particular printed book is using. Uh, it either looks like a, a squiggle uh, above the letter like here, or it can look just like an upside down U. But in both cases, it's immediately above the letter. You should not try to use these accents. Why? Well, usually they have no effect on meaning and they're very tricky to use correctly. Um, really, that system of, of accent marks is a medieval invention. It, these weren't even used at the time when the New Testament was written. Uh, so in most cases, we'll ignore them. There are just a few words where it's important to have the accent because it changes the meaning of the word. And we'll discuss those when those words come up later. But for now, you can just ignore the accent marks. What do the accent marks mean? Well, they can help with pronunciation. If you're looking at a New Testament text, the accent is placed on the stressed syllable. So that can uh, show you where the stress should be when you're uh, pronouncing uh, the word, where the emphasis should be. And you can just treat all four accents as equivalent showing emphasis. Historically, these accents showed changes in pitch or tone for pronunciation, but these different tones fell out of use in Hellenistic Greek, and so they, they don't really uh, apply to the period of Greek that we're studying. 
Um, they can occasionally help with remembering forms, uh, and the circumflex accent and diuresis often indicate that two letters have combined, have been smooshed together. Um, but uh, I don't think that that help with remembering forms uh, offsets the complication of trying to learn to use them correctly. So for our purposes in Paideia, uh, we'll ignore them most of the time. So we can use these Greek letters to spell out familiar English words like bed. And you can see in the chart there, uh, beta, epsilon, delta. Uh, deck, we would uh, spell out with a delta epsilon. Now, instead of CK, uh, we would just uh, use the, the Greek letters that make the sounds of deck. So we would have delta epsilon and just kappa, which all on its own makes that k sound. Um, the word deal uh, would start with a delta d. Our EA together make an E sound. So we ask, well, what Greek letter makes an E sound? Iota does. So we would have delta, iota, and then uh, a letter that we haven't seen yet, uh, the lambda, which makes an L sound. Uh, we could make the word mute uh, by starting with a mu for the m, the m sound, then putting the E, the upsilon in the middle, and closing it with a tau. Uh, we can't put an epsilon on the end. Uh, and if you remember, I said that with epsilon, we always pronounce it. It's never a silent epsilon. So we, if we put one on the end of uh, the word here, uh, we would actually pronounce that muta, uh, which isn't the same as the word mute, right? If we want the same sound as our word mute, we have to stop with the tau, just mu Upsilon tau. This is the kind of exercise that the townspeople will uh, ask you to do at the beginning uh, as you're working through Paideia exercise. And this is to help you become comfortable with the Greek letters and their sounds. Uh, after you've been doing this for a little while, you'll find that these letters uh, don't look strange to you anymore and you just automatically recognize the sounds that they make. You can find more about the Greek alphabet and the accents and the breathing marks and pronunciation in uh, some of the following uh, videos, as well as in Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek. And uh, you can see there the uh, references for the chapter on the Greek alphabet and the sections on accents and breathing marks. Just be aware that Mounts introduces the whole alphabet and writing system at once. We're moving more slowly, more gently. So if Mounts' chapter is overwhelming at first, don't worry. All right, uh, we're going to get there. And we'll see you in the next video.